the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good afternoon. Christianity stands by personal faith and commitment. Yet, Christian existence is basically corporate. To be a Christian means to be in a community, in the church, and of the church. But the personal is not to be dissolved in the corporate, nor Christian togetherness should be degenerate into a kind of impersonalism. impersonalism. The first followers of our Lord were regular members of an established community of the house of Israel the chosen people of God. This little flock, that, co that community, which our Lord Jesus Christ had gathered around himself, was in fact the faithful remnant of Israel, the reconstituted people of God. It was reconstituted by the call of God, by the announcement of the kingship by the good news of salvation. And yet, to this call, each person has to respond individually by an act of personal faith. This personal faith, however, incorporates the believer into community. And two aspects of Christian existence, the personal and the corporate, are linked together and they're inseparable. One is saved only in the community, and yet salvation is mediated always through the personal faith and obedience. This basic duality of Christian existence is conspicuously reflected in the realm of worship. Christian worship is at once personal, is at once personal and corporate. Even though they may be in tension at times. For example, in the Sermon of the Mount, the multitudes were exhorted to pray in secret, in seclusion, and in solitude. And this we read in the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 6, verse 5. However, it must be stressed that this injunction was directed primarily towards the hypocrites, against those who display a pretentious ostentation when it came to worship, yet prayer is basically, again, a personal action. It's always a person who prays in an intimate encounter with the living God. And yet, paradoxically, even in this seclusion, one can pray only as a member of the redeemed community. No true worshiper can ever forget that his father is also the common father of all believers of mankind. No true Christian can pray only for himself. He not only pray for him, not for himself, or for anyone in the same room. Christian prayer can never be strictly private, although it must be always personal. On the other occasion, our Lord was speaking to one of the disciples of the mystery of joined, joined prayer. When we read in Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, the gathering in the name of Christ is in itself a gift of the Spirit. Prayer in secret 
and prayer in common actually belong to each other inseparably as, as, as aspects of the same devotional common action. They are committed to one another. There is no choice. They must be practiced together. Indeed, it is the rule of the church that believers should prepare themselves for corporate worship by their personal devotions at home. For the climax of Christian worship and also its center it is Holy Communion in which Christ himself appears in the midst of those gathered in his name. Christian prayer, said St. Cyprian, is essentially the prayer of the people, since we, who are the people, make the whole church, are the one that constitutes not only the church, but we are the body of Christ, and Christ himself being the head of the body. According to the goal and the measure of the Christian worship is an anatomy <clears throat> with one heart, excuse me, one heart and one mouth. Christian worship is essentially an encounter. Yet at the same time, it is a dialogue. There are always two partners in worship. The worshiper is always expecting an answer. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. In the day of trouble, trouble, I will call upon you. And we call on God because he has called on us first. Thus, as a Christian, When we worship, we respond to the call of God. We respond to the challenge of God. Many met the challenge of the Annunciation. Abraham met the challenge of the call. Moses met the challenge of leadership. Job met the challenge of being patient. We call on our Lord, our God, because He has revealed Himself through the ages in a special event, through special messages, and finally in only begotten Son, who came down to the earth to dwell among men in order for their salvation. Christians, throughout the centuries, always pray to God. They pray to God through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is our Lord, because one comes to the Father only through, to, only through to the Son. There are always, <clears throat> excuse me, there are always two major emphasis on worship. The first is remembrance. The second, thanksgiving, thanksgiving, and the Christina. And these two, again, belong together and separable. The starting point of Christian worship is commemoration or remembrance. God has acted once and for all. Man now has to acknowledge God's gracious action and to testify his love and glory. Under the old law, the whole structure of Jewish worship was essentially historic. In the New Testament, 
history has been preserved. As we pray and worship, we think of the Incarnation, we think of the Cross, we think of the Resurrection, we think of Pentecost. But the center of the Christian worship, as I said a few moments ago, is Holy Eucharist, the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. An elaborate cycle of daily offices has been built around the center of this devotion. Yet the Eucharist is not only a particular office, a particular apurutia, but primarily a sacrament, a mysterium. However, the rite is obviously an anah, is obviously an anah, an anah, an a memorial of the Lord according to his ordinance. Christ himself is actually present in the right, both as the minister and the victim. In the words of St. John Chrysostom, the Eucharist is the Eucharist celebration is actually the Last Supper itself. It is fully, it is a full reality without diminution. The offering is the same, whether it be offered by ordinary men, such as you or I were ordained, or by Paul or Peter. That which Christ gave to his, his apostles and that which the priest ministered to now is the same because it is not men that sanctify this, but the same who sanctified the other. There is no difference. The paradoxical nature of sacramental memorials and remembrances, which at the same time an encounter for communion with the Lord reveals the ultimate mystery of the Christian existence. The body can never be separate from the head. There is in the church a certain mysterious continuity between Christ the Savior and his children, his beloved Christians. Indeed, the Eucharistic remembrance is also kinonia. Communion. It's an encounter. Those who commemorate the Lord are not outside of Him, but in Him. They belong to His fullness, to the Plerma, which is the Holy Church. The major prayer in the right is the Anaphora, an elaborate memorial, remembrance of the great God from creation to the Last Supper. And Christ's injunction to do this is remembrance of Him. It is a remembrance in the form of thanksgiving, a Christia as a response of man to, ben to the benevolence or the philanthropia of God himself. Christian worship is primarily an expression of grateful acknowledgement, of praise, and of adoration, always culminating 
in doxology. Thus, worship is the norm of our Christian existence. It should be the constant disposition or our attitude of each and every one of us. It is through worship that the new, that the new man is formed and the way he believes. It is through worship that baptismal grace and the gift of adoption is granted unto the believer. The Christian must always the Christian must be always in the state of worship, whether it is expressed in words or not. The search for the Spirit is the moving force of worship. It may happen that at a certain moment in worship that the Spirit starts speaking within our hearts. Then one has to stop and listen to what the Spirit is saying to us. The Eucharist is the ultimate mystery of the Church. A sacramental consumption. The goal and the term of life. The Eucharist is the summit of a Christian pilgrimage. In the Eucharist, those who are separated and estranged from earth and from other men, from the frailty, are brought together in the perfect and intimate unity of the one body of Christ. Human exclusiveness and the mutual separation of men from one another is now overcome. In the Eucharist, the essential unity of Christians finds its way to be one again and it's perfect in its perfect expression. Of course, one has to be spiritually prepared for this participation in the mystery of the worshiping church. One needs to be cleansed and purified. Worship in the closet is indispensable. But it can be consummated only in the common celebration of the ultimate mystery of Christ in the communion with our brethren. And it is in the church The church that this great mysterium is celebrated. This ultimate mystery of Christ in Holy Communion, which we celebrate with one another, takes place from which one can very readily draw the conclusion why, no matter how much we believe or pray, taking Holy Communion, taking the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in His Church, along with His brother, our brothers and sisters, is the ultimate and the most acceptable form of worship that a person, that you 